about you, but I hate the feeling that users are being inconvenienced as I'm redeploying an application. My goal here in this episode is to make it so users can't even tell when an app is being deployed. Now, I already have this application deployed to a VPS like I show in episode 337. And when I redeploy this app, it's not too noticeable because it's such a small application that it starts up pretty quickly. So what I'm going to do is simulate the startup of a larger application by going to my application config file and sleeping for 10 seconds here. This way, the startup time will be more noticeable when I redeploy. Now let me commit that change really quickly, simulating a long app load, and then I'll uh, push this up, and then I'll issue a cap deploy, which will end up restarting the app. So right after the cap deploy, try reloading the page, and now notice that it takes quite a while to load because the application is still starting up. And there we go, it finally finished loading. Uh, we didn't get an error message here, which is good, but it would be nice if the user didn't see that long loading delay. And we can accomplish this by leaving the old version of the application up and running until the new one is ready to accept requests. Now there are many solutions to this problem. One option is if you have a load balancer set up, such as HAProxy, you can do rolling restarts across the multiple servers. Uh, this presents its own challenges though, because it needs to detect what the state is for each given server to see if it can pass requests to it. Now I won't be going into detail on this here, but I just wanted to point it out as an option. Instead, I want to focus on solving this through Unicorn. Now GitHub's blog post on the subject is an oldie but a goodie. It provides some configuration options which you can use to accomplish zero downtime through it. One key option is preload app. Uh, this will start up the Rails app in the master unicorn process, so spawning new workers will happen very quickly. Also to go along with this is the before fork block. So this will be triggered after the application loads, but before it spawns off new workers. And this means our application is ready to receive requests so we can quit the old unicorn process. And that's what this bit of code does right here. It looks up the old unicorn uh, PID, and then it sends a quit uh, command to it. Now it's important to understand that when preloading an app, it's not going to carry over the open socket connections when it forks off the workers. So it's a good idea to add an after hook block to reopen the socket connections, such as to the database. And that's what this after fork block does in the unicorn config, it basically calls active record base established connection to reopen the database connection. Now I already have unicorn set up in this app like I showed in episode 337 but my technique there doesn't do any app preloading as you can see here in this unicorn config file. So I'm going to paste in some code to do this. This will call it preload app, set it to true. And in my before fork block, I'm going to disconnect from the active record database in this main process and also quit the old unicorn process. And then in the after fork block, I'll reconnect to the database. Now I'm not done yet though, because I also need to configure how I restart Unicorn after deployment. Currently it's sending this HUP signal to the process, which uh, you can see if I have preload app set to true, it will have no effect. Instead I should send this USR2 signal, which will end up starting up a new Unicorn process, and then afterwards it expects me to quit the old one. By the way, there's a lot of great documentation here about how to manage the worker processes. I'll link to this in the show notes. I'm going to make this change inside of this unicorn init script that I'm using. Uh, there's this restart command, which currently sends that HUP signal. I'll change this to USR2. Now to get those changes up to the server, I'm going to run the unicorn setup task and also the unicorn stop and unicorn start tasks to basically stop and start the server so it picks up that new configuration. By the way, it's really nice to have Capistrano recipes like this so I can manage the server from here. Now before I redeploy this app, I'm going to make a small change here in this index template, just changing this to Articles 2, so that way we can see uh, when these changes actually go live. So I'll uh, commit this, uh, let's say uh, rename title, and then let's push that up, and then I'll run cap deploy. Now the deployment just finished, and you can see as I reload this page, it's still serving up the old version, and it will for about uh, 10 seconds or so, and then after that it should show us Articles 2, and there it is. So this is pretty neat. Since our application loads in the background, the user won't notice any delay when it switches over. Just keep in mind that you will need enough resources on your server to be able to load the application in the background while keeping the current version active and receiving requests. Next, I wanna move on to solving another piece of this zero downtime puzzle, and that is migrations. Any changes we make to the database, we need to make sure that they are compatible with the older release. Let me give you an example. Here I have this article model with a content column, but let's say I decide to rename this column to body 
instead. So I'm going to generate a new migration that renames the article's content column to body. And then in that migration, we only really need one method called a change because it knows how to generate the up and down. So I'll rename the column in the articles table of content to body, like this. So I'm going to uh, commit this change. Let's call it uh, rename articles content to body. And then I'll uh, push it up. Now let's try cap deploy migrations and see what happens. So that deploy command just finished, so let me reload this page and see what happens. And we get this 500 error. So this is because we're still serving the old version which references the content column which no longer exists in the database. But if I wait about 10 seconds and hit reload, then it serves it just fine. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the rule of thumb is to never destroy or rename a column that is referenced in the currently hosted version. However, adding columns works fine. So renaming columns can be a little tricky. How would we properly rename this article body column back to content if we wanted to? Well, instead we should generate a new migration that just simply adds the content column to the articles table. So that is a text type column. And then I'm going to generate a separate migration which copies the article content from the body. Now the reason I'm doing this in a separate migration is due to the way transactions work, uh, it doesn't allow you to add a column and then update it at the same time. So in this migration, I'm going to execute some SQL to uh, update the article's table and set the content based on the article's body. And on the down, I'm going to just reverse these two so that it actually updates the uh, body. So I'll add these changes in and commit them. Let's say add articles content column, and then I'll push those up as well. And now when I run cap deploy migrations, we shouldn't get any error because I'm just adding a column and not renaming or destroying one. Now the deploy just finished and I'll hit reload and it still works fine. So now that the current deploy no longer references the body column, it's safe to remove it. And if we name the migration like this, remove body from articles and then supply the type of column it is, then it'll automatically generate the up and down methods for us. And you can see that generated migration file here. So in order to rename a column, it took us three migration files and two deploys to do it properly. But at least this way, if we have zero downtime, the user won't get any 500 errors. Now there is still a problem with the solution though, and that has to do with this second migration file here where we copy the body to the content column. What if right after this migration runs, if a user updates the body content of the article and that happens while the uh, server is still starting up with the changes, so it falls through here and updates the body column, but the content column doesn't contain it. Now, whether or not this is a big issue depends upon how frequently uh, that given column is updated. Uh, usually updates don't happen very often, so the chances of it happening uh, within the 10 seconds or so of the app starting up with those new changes is pretty slim. However, if this is a problem for your app and you want to fix it, there are a couple of solutions. One is to lock this table after this migration runs and keep it locked until the app with the changes has fully started up. This way, no updates can take place during that time. However, locks can get pretty messy and this may not fully solve the problem anyway. Another option is just to give up on zero downtime for this kind of situation and just show a down for maintenance page while this kind of change is taking place. Now I don't recall ever covering maintenance pages in the past, so let me do that here. Capistrano provides a handy command called deploy web disable, which will generate a maintenance HTML file in your application. Now this won't actually show up in my setup because I don't have Nginx configured properly. Fortunately, there is some code here for adding to your Nginx config. Now I find this code works best near the top of the configuration, so I'm going to paste it right here in this server block. So what this does is check if the system maintenance file exists, and if it does, it's going to return a 503 error, and it's going to provide a custom error page for that given code, which will end up rewriting it to that maintenance HTML file, basically displaying it to the user with a 503 status. So I'll run the cap nginx setup task, which I created in episode 337, which will copy over that configuration file and restart the server. Now when I visit my application, because that maintenance file exists, it's going to display it, which looks like this. Uh, you probably want to configure this and customize it. Now I can check out the full documentation for this by passing in the dash E option, and that's called a deploy web disable. And this will tell me how I can configure it by passing in various environment variables like this. And also I can set the maintenance template path 
to change uh, what HTML file is used to generate the uh, maintenance page. So that's what I'll do here. Under this templates directory I already have set up, I'm going to make a new maintenance.html.erb uh, file. And I'll just paste in the code for this template. It's just a pretty much a static HTML file, but it does have some ERB content here for the reason and the deadline, which can be passed in through those variables you saw earlier. And then to use this template, I need to go to my deploy.rb file, and I'm just going to paste in that set maintenance template path uh, line, which sets it to the path to that maintenance template file. So now when you're ready to rename a column or something, you could just run that web disable command and that will copy over your new template. And now any user that visits your application will see that down for maintenance page. Until you're all done running the migrations or whatever, and you can run cap web enable to remove that maintenance page. And now reloading the page and we're back to our application. So if you're willing to show that maintenance page for a little bit, you can just rename the column in one migration instead of splitting it up like this. Now even with all this effort with the maintenance page, this still isn't a flawless solution. Imagine this scenario where the user comes to edit an article where we use the old body attribute, and then meanwhile while they're editing this, we do the renaming of the column, and then they make some changes, and then they submit this after the column has been renamed, then their changes are going to be lost because it's submitting as a body attribute, but our application no longer accepts that attribute. So if you are renaming a column, you might want to temporarily go into your model and add in a setter method for the old name, uh, setting it to the new attribute, and also make sure to add it to the adder accessible line. And then you can remove this attribute on the next deploy. Now most applications I don't think need to go to this extreme to handle these kind of edge cases, but there are some where you want to do everything you can to avoid losing any kind of user data if you're updating records frequently. Now I want to make a quick note about the Capistrano maintenance tasks. Uh, there's talk about removing them from Capistrano, but fortunately if you check out this deploy.rb file, you can see that these tasks are really small and simple, so creating them on your own uh, would be pretty easy to do if you want to. Well that's it for this episode on zero downtime deployment. I hope it gave you some ideas on how to make your deployment process a little smoother.